Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm Michael Tegos. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming back to the webinar, Michael J. Howell. Michael will look at the devastating implications of higher oil prices and China's latest monetary squeeze on global liquidity and the global market. Michael, of course, is Managing Director at Cross Border Capital, an investment advisory firm specializing in macro investing. Founded in 1996 uh, with an international client base, Cross Border focuses on monitoring and understanding global liquidity and capital flows. Before we start, uh, some of our standard housekeeping. Uh, after Michael's presentation, we will leave some time uh, for Q&A, so you're welcome to send in any questions you might have using the Q&A button that you'll find on your Zoom app. Please do not reshare or reproduce the contents of this webinar without our express permission. You will find a recording uh, of the whole session in the registration page afterwards. With uh, that out of the way and without further ado, uh, Michael, let me welcome you to the webinar. Thank you for being with us once again today. Uh, the floor is yours. Good, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, talking about global liquidity. Global liquidity is the most important thing for investors right now. In fact, we'd argue it's probably always the most important thing. But certainly markets have had the benefits of huge inflows of liquidity uh, over the period of the last two years following the COVID emergency. Uh, but I think as we'll argue, or as you'll see, uh, the outlook uh, is the outlook for world and the world financial markets is really dominated again by this global li li uh, liquidity picture and really understanding it is critical to the world. Uh, the events in Russia and Ukraine in the last um, two weeks have clearly been devastating. Um, war is never a pleasant thing, but the implications of that for the world economy and for liquidity are also quite grim. In terms of understanding what that means, let me show you first of all a chart which tracks Russian financial conditions. Uh, this chart is looking at how much finance has tightened in Russia since the invasion. This is data up to the end of February, uh, presumably March, and as March unfolds, it's gonna be as grim as this. So we've never seen uh, tightening as severe of this really in any economy worldwide. And the effects with, for the Russian economy are clearly very bleak, but there must be a spillover effect. The direct effects of this, uh, of Russia on the world economy are probably de minimis. Uh, Russia represents about 0.6% of global liquidity uh, and something like 0.8% of global financial assets. But it's the indirect effects that are very important. And those indirect effects come from higher commodity prices and some of the implications of the volatility in commodity prices in terms of the collateral uh, in money markets and repo markets worldwide. And that's one of the factors that I want to uh, touch on. But the other thing to stress is that this is happening anyway against the background of tightening liquidity. Even before the Russian invasion, central banks around the world had begun to tighten uh, beginning in the second half of 2021. Uh, that is ongoing. Uh, the Federal Reserve last night, actually uh, another notch in the tightening was announced. Uh, and it's that background as well that we need to take in uh, when understanding markets. First of all, why is liquidity important and what is liquidity? What we look at is a concept that we think of as financial liquidity. It's the amount of funds that are circulating in world financial markets. And it basically consists of wholesale money flows that are really outside of traditional retail money or what many analysts think of as money supply, M1 or M2. What we're looking at is a concept that is much, much broader, uh, is concentrated within the financial sector and probably is best uh, summarized as a measure of the gross financial sector balance sheet or the ability of that balance sheet to essentially refinance. The second thing to say about why liquidity is important is really to address uh, a misunderstanding or misnomer uh, in terms of economics. Uh, economic textbooks often tell you uh, that the uh, world financial system is a new financing system that basically funds capital investment and that capital investment goes to drive economic growth. Uh, for many, many economies, no longer is that true. World financial markets are a refinancing system they're really involved in rolling over existing debts. 
the huge amount of debt we've got in the world economy, some 300 trillion, uh, which sits with a maturity of around about five years, means that about 60 trillion of debt has to be refinanced every year. You need balance sheet capacity to do that. And it's liquidity, which is a measure of that balance sheet capacity. And that liquidity is increasingly controlled by central banks around the world. The two primary central banks uh, which control that flow are the US Federal Reserve and the People's Bank of China. And I intend to focus on those in this presentation. First of all, what is liquidity doing? One of the ways that we can measure that is through an index, which makes comparison uh, over time uh, much easier. This is a normalized index of global liquidity conditions. Uh, we've been tracking global liquidity for uh, about 30 years now. Uh, it was a concept that we invented uh, when I worked back at Salomon Brothers, the US investment bank, uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and it's a concept which is critical, certainly to understanding fixed income markets, uh, forex markets, and of course, equity markets. And the implications of the financial market linkage go on to the real economy uh, and draw out further implications there in terms of the business cycle. What you can see on the chart are a series of inflections. Uh, the cycle, uh, as cycles do goes, go up and down, uh, we've seen a tremendous explosion in liquidity upwards, uh, really from the time of the COVID crisis, uh, or there or thereabouts. And what we're now seeing is liquidity beginning to go down. That cyclical movement is already affecting financial markets adversely. Uh, it's leading to a significant flattening in yield curves worldwide. Uh, it's heightening volatility, and it's causing a headwind for equity markets, which we think is likely to get worse. And that will translate into slower economic growth. As investors, you need to understand the implications of this. First of all, what is the impact on financial wealth? What I've shown in this chart is global liquidity conditions which is shown as a very simple year-on-year -year change of the total stock of liquidity, in this case in orange. And alongside, I've shown the uh, growth or the returns from global wealth. So this is a world wealth portfolio, and it's showing how that moves uh, in comparison with liquidity. Uh, in that, uh, included in that wealth portfolio are uh, equities, uh, fixed income, uh, all liquid asset uh, holdings, uh, gold, uh, the housing, the private housing stock. Uh, this is a, a very, very broad aggregate. And what you can see from the chart is an impressive correlation between these two data series. Uh, what you get from liquidity is rises or falling falls in uh, world wealth. Uh, in other words, asset markets move. The correlations I've shown, uh, first of all, in the period up to 2010, where there was a decent correlation between the two series, and then the period post-2010, uh, really following the global financial crisis in 2008-9. And that correlation has tightened significantly, really because central banks have muscled forward and have taken more control uh, over that liquidity, uh, those liquidity, uh, uh, liquidity creation in the world economy. Here is a more um, up-to-date or granular uh, piece of evidence, which is uh, the MSCI World Index, uh, which is shown in orange there. And alongside, I've just tracked uh, inflows into US money markets uh, from the Federal Reserve. Uh, so this is the impact that the Fed has directly on world financial markets. And you can see the movements are largely coincident, certainly since the COVID emergency. Uh, that's again, a critical point to understand. And now if you look at that orange line, uh, which is the MSCI world, it's basically tracking the downward inflection that you've seen in Fed liquidity. Uh, the Fed liquidity uh, series peaked around about late 2021. It's been falling pretty much ever since, apart from last week where there was a blip up, which may have been uh, extra accommodation uh, because of the Russian invasion. Uh, but generally, we believe that trend is downwards. And certainly reading the uh, minutes of the FOMC statement last night, uh, listening to the press conference, this is exactly what we think is likely happening uh, going forward. The Fed is on course to tighten liquidity. Let me show a couple of examples here of how liquidity works. Historically, the chart on the left-hand side is showing the S&P 500 as the dotted line through the period of the global financial crisis and contemporaneously 
we show US liquidity as that orange line. Uh, what I've done to show that there is a forward uh, or a, a lead time on liquidity that has a forward forecasting ability, what I've done here is to shift forward the US liquidity series, that orange line, uh, so it sits pretty much on top of the S&P index uh, through that period. And I've shifted it forward eight months uh, to show that there is a very decent lead time in terms of what, uh, what liquidity is doing. And I think you can see that evidence anyway on that earlier chart with the Federal Reserve. Here are two other examples which are looking at emerging market equities and emerging market liquidity. Uh, first of all, at the time of the Asian crisis, again showing that same lead time. Uh, and you can see almost one for one movements in emerging market liquidity corresponded to uh, a following uh, movement downwards and then upwards in EM equities through the period of the Asian crisis in 1998, in 1997, 98. And then again, if you look at the period of the global financial crisis, again, you can see a very strong correspondence between these liquidity flows. Liquidity matters hugely to financial markets. Now, where it really comes through, uh, and most evidently or most obviously, which I think very few people would disagree with, is the fixed income markets. And what I want to show now is what the fixed income markets are telling us and how they are getting traction, uh, negative traction as it happens, for the decline in liquidity and what this means for real economies and markets going forward. We cannot uh, ignore the message from bonds. Bonds are the truth in many ways, the asset class that doesn't lie. And what you see in this chart are basically two measures of the US term structure. The first one of those is the black line, which is looking at implied uh, 10 year uh, forward rate expectations uh, for the one year forward rate. Uh, in other words, the one year forward in 10 years time. And that is showing how much rate expectations have increased. Now, if that is a measure of the cost of corporate refinancing, basically corporations are suddenly seeing uh, a, a very significant increase in the cost of refinancing their debt. The orange line is the US term premium. Now that may be a, a wonkish concept to many, but it's a critical number to understand because this is what drives the yield curve. Uh, term premium are the main factor that are swinging around the long end of the US term structure. And as, that term, as those term premium collapse, so the yield curve is flattening. Now, what do collapsing term premium really tell us? They're telling us that there is increased appetite uh, for uh, longer dated safe US debt. So in other words, whereas there was a positive premium uh, earlier on in the period, what you're seeing now is you're getting a bigger and bigger negative term premium on US treasuries. And that is telling you the appetite of the world of the average investor for US safe assets is going through the roof. Why are investors so keen on safety? Because liquidity is being crunched and they can't refinance. They're concerned about refinancing. Therefore, they're going for the safety of US treasuries. We believe this cycle is going to end at a lower level of interest rates than many people currently envisage because we don't think there's the ability of the Federal Reserve to tighten that much. But tighten they are going to try. And as you see in most cycles, uh, the Federal Reserve tightens until something breaks. And that something breaking is the real economy. If you look at these two indicators, they show very prescient guides to what's happening in the world real economy. The first series is the black line, which is showing the diffusion index that we create from OECD leading indicator data, which basically shows the percentage of countries that are seeing declining leading indicators. That is a fantastic heads up on what the cycle of world business is doing, and that is collapsing. Corresponding to that, but a very independent and different data series is the future outlook from the Michigan, US Michigan Consumer Survey that is shown in orange there. And that has deteriorated pari pursue with what you're seeing in the OECD database. And that is showing, that's telling us, warning us that things are getting grimmer. Uh, and that's exactly the message the bond markets have been saying. Equities cannot ignore this for much longer. Is China going to bail us out? Uh, I don't think so. 
What I show here are two pieces of evidence as to what the Chinese are doing in their money markets. We look at this uh, on a daily basis to try and understand what the People's Bank is up to. But as we've been arguing for many months, if not now years, China has changed its policy mix from growth at all costs to one of stability. Stability is key, particularly stability of the yuan exchange rate. And most interventions in money markets tend to correspond or are triggered by periods of weakness or strength in the yuan uh, against its notional basket. What you can see on the left-hand chart are uh, liquidity injections by the PBOC on a daily basis, but shown as a three-month annualized change in the stock of open market operations. There is no evidence in this data that the PBOC is changing direction, even if you look at latest operations today. Uh, there may be calming words from the markets after the extreme sell-off, but there's no indication here of a change in direction yet from the People's Bank in terms of policy. What that chart is saying is that effectively, the People's Bank balance sheet is flatlining. Uh, stability is the watchword, there is no evidence of any significant liquidity injections. However, if you look at the data on the right, this shows that there was some intervention around the time of the Ukraine invasion. However, that has now been withdrawn. And if you look at the bars, they're reflecting liquidity injections by the PBOC uh, just prior to and immediately after the Ukraine invasion. Uh, the red bar is the day of the invasion, uh, the dotted tram lines show one standard deviation and two standard deviations up in normal liquidity injections by the PBOC. So there was a lot of money dished into Chinese markets around the time of the invasion, maybe to calm them. But what you've seen in the subsequent days are a major withdrawal of liquidity. So again, it's stability. China was probably trying to stabilize for any potential shock. Uh, and now we're looking at uh, you know, more, more normal or more recently normal uh, levels of liquidity. Secondly, what sort of steer do we get by looking at what the Federal Reserve is doing in terms of the US long-term liquidity cycle? Now, this data is a long-term data, goes all the way back to 1970. It's trying to show how regular liquidity cycles are and why we need to pay very strict attention to them. The COVID crisis didn't change the cycle, but it may well have pushed it slightly out in terms of adding a year uh, to the duration and maybe increasing the amplitude slightly. But notwithstanding, the cycle is now coming down much as expected, and it looks like it's going to trough sometime in 2023. But we're in a downswing. The Federal Reserve is not doing a Volcker, perhaps, by stamping aggressively on the interest rate break, but they are withdrawing liquidity. And the FOMC statement last night very clearly said they're going to contemplate or will uh, shrink their balance sheet at coming meetings. That is something that we do not think that financial markets can cope with, because again, I stress the fact that it is a refinancing system that needs liquidity to turn over this whopping amount of debt that currently exists uh, you know, on our shoulders. That's the major concern we've got. And every time the Federal Reserve has tried to withdraw liquidity uh, over the last decade, there has been a financial market wobble or collapse even. The last point to note is the effect that oil has on the world economy. And this may be another negative, but it's the indirect effects of the Russian crisis. And I think we can add to oil other commodity prices, uh, even foodstuffs, as we know that's uh, likely to get uh, an, upward, uh, an upward jolt to prices because of uh, the implications of the Ukraine invasion as well. What this chart is demonstrating is our global liquidity index in orange, shown as an index on the left-hand side of the page, and oil prices inverted in terms of percentage change year on year, but advanced forward uh, by nine months. And what it's trying to demonstrate is that periods of very strong oil price growth tend to cause liquidity to collapse. Now, there are broadly speaking three or four reasons why that collapse occurs. And I just want to mention each one of those because it's important to understand. The first implication is that if oil prices go up and inflation gets uh, pushed higher or faster, 
there's, there is a need for more liquidity in the real economy to finance transactions. And those transactions will be financed by liquidity that will be pulled out of financial markets. Secondly, what you've got is a further effect that corporate profits, or in other words, corporate savings, corporate cash flow, will be dented by the higher oil prices. That again depletes global liquidity because one of the elements that feeds global liquidity increasingly over the years has been corporate surpluses. The third factor is the effect on financial market dislocations of problems in, with collateral uh, and margin requirements because of the higher volatility in the commodity markets. Commodity margin, sorry, com margins on commodity lending uh, or collateral sources of collateral would have jumped through this period, and that is likely to cause distress among a number of lenders, and it may well cause even defaults uh, among some of those lenders. So third factor. Fourth factor is that monetary authorities themselves may respond to the higher inflation. They will want to dent inflation expectations, and therefore they're likely uh, to muscle in and, uh, if you like, amplify their tightening cycle. So altogether, what we're looking at here, and I can go back and maybe summarize with this US chart, is a liquidity cycle that is going down. Um, that is likely to be with us for many months. Don't expect a sudden bailout from the Fed. It's not coming. Don't expect a bailout from the People's Bank of China. It's not coming. Um, uh, clearly, if the facts change, we'll change our mind. But we monitor these things, and cycles are much more powerful uh, than, uh, than anecdote uh, looking at the data. And broadly, we think we're in a declining environment for liquidity, which means yield curves should be flattening. Um, and uh, as this chart demonstrates, the real economy is slowing. Uh, and these are worrying implications for uh, credit markets looking forward. Let me stop there to see if there are some questions. Uh, we've got about uh, eight to 10 minutes left. So let me hand back to Michael to see what the, uh, if there are questions. Thank you very much for this, Michael. Uh, as Michael said, uh, you can send in any questions you might have through the Q&A button uh, now, and uh, Michael will be able to address them. Um, we, can, uh, we can wait a bit for uh, any questions uh, to uh, come in. Um, Here we are. How many, there's a question just come, just come. How many rate hikes are you expecting this year from the US Central Bank? Uh, well, OK, I think the let me answer this in two ways. Uh, I think the, the, the first thing is, is to say that there will be several attempts at rate hikes. But I think what I've tried to say here uh, is that uh, it's not rate hikes that are a really important thing. It's the flow of liquidity. And that is the that's the key factor that we really want to stress. So it's the QT rather than rates that are the important thing. If we go back over the last uh, you know, 10 years, even the last 10 years, uh, rate changes in the US have not really been that important. It's all been about the flow of liquidity. And it's curtailing the liquidity flow that is the thing that worries us. Now, I'm going to try and answer your question directly because uh, everyone thinks in terms of rates, even though we, we, we downplay it. So let me try and give a, a sense as to the direction of what they're doing. The Federal Reserve is likely to try to do uh, or, or the latest figures would suggest maybe six or seven rate hikes. Uh, there may even be thrown in there a 50 basis point jump at one stage. I think the thing to think about here is that look at history for a guide. And history tells us that over the last 50 years, Fed funds has never traded through the five-year note yield. So that would suggest there is a cap on really what the Federal Reserve is able to do in rate increases. And I would suggest that the worse the economic outlook gets, the more the five-year bond is going to respond uh, to that by yields dropping. So I think the ability of the Federal Reserve to do five or even six rate increases is, is questionable. Uh, I think that the QT is important. That's what they're going to stress more. Uh, that is the issue I think that uh, we cope with. So I'd be optimistic that we're not going to get the sort of rate hikes that many people are thinking about, but don't rule out the fact that uh, Fed tightening is important for markets. In other words, the, there's, a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, and that light is probably nearer than we think, but it's actually quite a dark tunnel we're going through for the next 
three to six months. Um, what I for has a forecast of the S&P by 2022 and 2023. Let me put it this way. If you get a normal liquidity correction or a downswing in liquidity, it normally means that markets fall by 15 to 20 percent. That's pretty much what we're looking at now. If you get a recession on top of that, add another 15 percent down. If you get a financial crisis to that, add a further 15 percent. So if we got liquidity tightening, recession, and financial dislocations, we're talking about 50% down. If we're looking at the first two, recession and liquidity tightening, 30%. My guess would be the S&P would be down another 15% from here before we hit the lows. We haven't had the second wind yet, if you like, the second leg down, which is when people start to change earnings expectations and economic expectations. Another question- Sorry. Yeah, uh, we actually have quite a few questions coming in now. Uh, so let's jump to the next one. Uh, do you think that the deglobalization that seems to be underway will be another headwind for global liquidity? And do you think that it will lead to structurally higher costs of capital? Uh, it's a very good question. I don't know if I can answer that question fully because it's clearly a very gray area. Um, about two years ago, I wrote a book called Capital Wars, which really addressed this issue of how the world would be cleaved into two halves, one dominated by the US and one dominated by China. And I think the outlook is still very much for that particular, uh, that particular outlook. I think the implications of the Russian crisis may well put any uh, separation between those, sphere, those spheres, uh, push it out further, but clearly China is thinking more and more and more about the role of uh, the renminbi uh, as a separate or challenger, separate currency or challenger to the US dollar. Uh, if that happens, the cost of capital will go up uh, simply because you're uh, sharing liquidity amongst a more concentrated or more limited pool. I think the question to raise in all this is uh, about the, the renminbi and about the dollar, if that's where the question is also looking, uh, is that uh, it basically emphasizes regionalism. It emphasizes friends versus foes. In other words, are you a friend of the US or are you a foe? And I think that the alacrity with which uh, sanctions are put on Russia shows that the US has been planning this for some time. Uh, you know, I don't believe they got that concert of agreement overnight. Uh, I think basically it was a planned move. Uh, the movement of swap lines is a critical thing to trace out who is your friend or who is your foe. China has swap lines, the US has swap lines, and it's really a, a question of uh, addressing who's in which camp. Uh, my view is that what's critical to understanding currencies and globalization is not so much uh, what is the best vehicle currency, in other words, which is the currency of denomination, but it's much more about uh, which is your funding currency. At the moment, the dollar is the main funding currency, even for China, and that will take years to change. So while we're looking at that particular backdrop, until the yuan is a funding currency, which may be as long as 10 or 20 years away, I don't think the dollar has a challenge, effective challenger. And that means that China will have to stay close to the US financial system because it needs dollars, uh, certainly for the next decade. Thank you for that. Uh, before we move on to the following questions, uh, just to uh, reply to the attendees asking about a recording of the webinar. Uh, there will be one available after the session, and we will be sharing it with attendees. So you will hear more about that after the session. Um, another question is, what would be the indicators you'd be looking to assess a tro in liquidity conditions? Or a trough, I guess. To, to the answer, what would affect, what would give it a trough in liquidity? Uh, basically, look at the indicators that we monitor. I mean, that's what capital's expertise is. We're actually looking at that. If you want a trailing indicator, uh, the answer would be to look at um, look at the look at U.S. term premium. Uh, that should tell you uh, by implication that should come out in the yield curve slope. Uh, but you know this is probably six months after liquidity has actually troughed. So we have to monitor the flows to get a clear guide. But that's what I would be. I, it would be the fixed income markets but feel the effect of liquidity first. Understood, thank you very much. 
Uh, what, what are the expectations for Fed's balance sheet reduction on liquidity? Well, I think the answer is 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 wholly negative. I mean, the uh, the the fact is that what we're that even before this crisis in Russia, we were expecting, uh, or the Federal Reserve was actually slating that it was it was going to contract the balance sheet this year. Uh, that's true also of the European Central Bank, despite uh, you know the 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 words, the uh, you know the uh, the benign words of uh, Christine Lagarde, who heads the ECB. Uh, the reality is. But they were also going to shrink their balance sheet. And as we've seen in the case of China, China at best is flatlining its balance sheet. It didn't have the big surge that America or the, East, or the Europe did. Uh, the Fed is going to contract its balance sheet. The implications of that liquidity are not great. And the reason for that is that the Federal Reserve, compared to 2008 9, now has three times the impact on global liquidity uh, that it had then. And that's because of all the controls that the Federal Reserve has put in place for controlling liquidity ratios of banks, uh, the repo markets, uh, for controlling swap lines uh, to foreign governments, et cetera. So there's much more control from the central banks. So QT is definitively bad news. Uh, there's a question that's coming through the chat. Um, would declining liquidity help to reduce inflation? Uh, the, well, the answer to that is, is indirectly yes, but directly no. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the fact is that inflation, uh, as we record it through CPI, is a real economy phenomenon, uh, not a monetary phenomenon. I mean, I want to dismiss the, you know, the arguments that is, is often, often said that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. It's not. It's a real economy phenomenon. However, if liquidity gets into the real economy, then it will drive higher inflation. So that's really the question to ask is not so much how much liquidity there is in the system, is how much liquidity is moving into the real economy. And at the moment, what we're arguing is that actually liquidity is tight generally, and the flow of liquidity into the real economy will be challenged because of that. And therefore, inflation is likely to come down. Now, I think that uh, you know that's that would be brought in my conclusion. I think the other thing that one of the things, one of the other things that we look at very closely is the long-term drivers of inflation in the real economy. And those tend to be actually demographic factors, particularly things like the labor force growth. And if you look at the record uh, of all the major economies through uh, US, Japan, and even China, what you find is that inflation movements, uh, long-term inflation movements, are all about demographics and the growth of uh, the young workforce in each of those economies. And what the implication is in each of the three cases is that inflation comes down and remains low in the medium term. There is a blip now, but the best cure for higher prices is higher prices, not tighter liquidity. Liquidity is much, much more about financial stability. Understood. Thank you very much. Uh, another question is, uh, what do you expect for FX given this backdrop, especially the US dollar versus the Chinese one uh, with both tightening? It's a very good question because the elephant in the room uh, for the last three or four years has been the US dollar uh, CMY exchange rate, uh, the yuan uh, US dollar cross. And if you look at what's happening, uh, you know, as they say in America, if it's yellow and it quacks, it's a duck. And if you look at currency markets in Asia, what you're looking at is the lowest level of currency volatility that we've seen since the Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate system that ended in the early 1970s. Uh, what's happening is that there is de facto a fixed or a managed exchange rate system going on in Asia, and it's basically gravitating around the yuan. Chinese movements of liquidity in our view, looking at what the People's Bank do, does each day is about trying to control that cross rate. So uh, I would almost turn the question around and say, what are the implications of liquidity uh, from a stable uh, CNY uh, US dollar exchange rate? And that's, that's really the key thing. That's what I think is China's goal to create stability in that cross rate. And that's what they need if you think about China expanding within the region, making the uh, renminbi, the core currency, 
which others fix against, and then looking at the distribution of supply chains. They need currency stability, and that's what they seem to be focused on. Understood, thank you very much. Uh, another question is, uh, one of the biggest dollar liquidity beneficiaries in Asia over the last many years has been Taiwan. Do you have thoughts on how this might change? Well, the, I mean, uh, assuming that the question is not about geopolitics and about, how, well, about the relationship there, I think the, um, I think the key thing is that, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the, the Northeast Asian markets, uh, Korea, Taiwan in particular, what you find is that they tend to they tend to respond to U.S. liquidity at the margin, uh, you know, very significantly. I mean, Hong Kong is maybe a, a, a third example, although Hong Kong is increasingly in the China orbit, and so U.S. dollar flows matter uh, increasingly less to Hong Kong. But certainly, if you look at Korea Taiwan, uh, one has to uh, reach a conclusion that at the margin it's very important. If U.S. liquidity tightens, uh, these markets are, are going to be hammered downwards. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not a nice prospect, but clearly they're also in the, in the tech area. And you can see that tech is a long duration investment and long duration investments don't do well when liquidity is, is falling. Thank you for that. Um, we are running just a bit over time and there are uh, a few more I'm questions keep going, uh, coming. Uh, excellent. Uh, so in that case, um, there's a, there's a question again in the chat uh, with, that uh, pertains to something that you have written quite a lot about and spoken about before. Um, and uh, the question is, do you subscribe to the theory that we are in an everything bubble? And if so, would the impact of declining liquidity result in a much greater drop to the equity markets compared to previous liquidity withdrawals? Well, I, 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 the answer is, is it an everything bubble? Yes. but then. <laughs> We're, we always see everything bubbles. I mean, basically, uh, the, the transmission uh, of liquidity into asset markets is, is via duration. Uh, and what you find is that more, more liquidity means more duration. Different, as, different asset classes are characterized by their degree of duration. A very high risk uh, asset has a lot of duration in it. Uh, a very low risk asset has limited duration. So basically, what you find is that when uh, liquidity expands, uh, long duration investments, take it for example, tech, uh, what that basically does is, um, uh, is, is, is just, you know, destroys duration and therefore you get, um, uh, you get um, uh, markets falling. So that's the transmission. What does it mean in terms of uh, this particular cycle? You know, I, you know, I've said, I think that, you know, normal correction, if liquidity tightens could be 15% down, get a recession as well, it's 30% down. I think we are going to get a recession. So I'm in the camp that says this is probably a 30% correction. If you get financial dislocation and another 15% to that uh, globally, so you're talking nearly 50%, uh, I don't think you're going to get financial dislocation this time. Uh, I, you know, I'm hope I'm not, uh, I'm not proved wrong, but I think that that's, that would be my sense, mainly because these problems are coming at the periphery of the financial system, not at the core. And I think central banks have got better tools now to address them. But nonetheless, we are going to see, I think, a significant correction. Uh, I mean, at the moment, investors, I mean, let, let, let me sort of pose a question, a rhetorical question. And that is that, you know, how many investors are still overweight equities? And how many funds anywhere do you know that are overweight bonds? I don't know anybody that's overweight bonds. We're moving into a potentially a recession. I mean, that's the, that's the, the head scratching moment. Thank you for that. Um, I guess uh, then the, this next question is, is also quite relevant. Uh, if you had to put $100 uh, to work in markets today, how would you allocate in light of uh, what we've talked about? Well, I think what I would do is I would, uh, I would play uh, the bond markets. Um, I would be uh, probably splitting that in a barbell. I'd be putting some at the front end of the curve because I think there's still some pretty decent returns there. And I'd be putting some uh, at the back end of the curve, maybe about the 10, 20 year area, because I think basically you're, you, you, we're somewhere near the peak in yields. Um, uh, that, that's what I would be thinking. So I think that, you know, broadly, our target on the US 10 year has been for the 10 year to hit a range of two and a quarter, two and a half. We're getting very close to that now. Uh, and I think that, you know, before this crisis is, uh, is over, uh, you're going to see yields back at about one and a half percent in the US. 
got it. Thank you for that. Uh, another question is, do you subscribe uh, to Zoltan's view that we're going to see Bretton Woods 3? <laughs> well, I mean, I think the answer is that, I mean, I think informally we're seeing it already. Um, and that, that's, that's been my argument for some time, but we're seeing it in Asia. Uh, are we going to see a formal movement? No, I mean, I mean, I mean, this in many cases, this question, uh, it, you know, hits the nub of what everybody should be thinking about, because the question is, did, I mean, really, the, the question is, did we ever finish Bretton Woods one? Um, and although, you know, the, the economics textbooks and the professors say, well, okay, it ended uh, with Nixon's uh, you know, with Nixon in August of 1971. In fact, the reality is that it didn't really, did it? I mean, actually, what are the what 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 was Bretton Woods one about? It was about uh, essentially the dollar at the center of the world financial system. We still got that. It was about the IMF. We still got that. And it was about the World Bank fostering development. We still got that. So actually, all the institutions and the framework uh, of Bretton Woods still exist. The only difference is we're operating. Uh, Bretton Woods won under a system where global capital flows uh, are moving more freely uh, and you've got probably wider bands for currencies and that that's really the only the only difference uh, so I think cynically I'd say that Bretton Woods is more or less still with us now I think the the subtle transformation has been that we've moved from a monetary system where currencies are pegged to the US dollar to a funding system whereby the dollar is the main funding currency and that's really the critical thing to think about when you're thinking about a monetary system. Uh, will the Chinese come in and muscle out the dollar? Well, in terms of transactions, maybe, but uh, that's not the question. The real answer is what is the future funding currency? And I think what we've seen, particularly in the wake of the Russian uh, uh, invasion and the blockade on Russian assets, is the dollar is the absolute paramount funding currency worldwide. You cannot avoid it. And any uh, dislocations that China was thinking about in terms of separating from the US financial system, I think has been put back at least 10 years by the events in the last two weeks. Thank you for that. Another question is, in considering the downside for liquidity withdrawal, uh, recession, et cetera, have you taken into account the fact that many non-index stocks have fallen 30 to 50% and even if S&P 500 or NASDAQ has done better? Uh, well, I, I'm thinking of the headline indexes in terms of, the, my, of my reckoning. Uh, and I, you know, I understand that, you know, I appreciate that you've got a lot of stocks, particularly small cap stocks and uh, other niche areas that have fallen a lot more, but that's all the case, is it not? Um, in terms of, uh, you know, what we're thinking about is, uh, uh, the indexes, that's how we, we've got to try, you know, think about investment. Uh, there'll be a lot more damage at the periphery, that's for sure. And there'll be some stocks that may even go up rather than go down. But that, that's not really the story. The story is what's the broad implication of liquidity uh, on financial assets. So uh, I'm still saying that the headline indexes have got further to fall. And I think the, you know, the key way to think about this is that the fixed income markets are currently discounting recession. And I, let, let me just emphasize the, the point here in a, maybe a more, uh, a, a more granular way. The track record of the yield curve is not great, okay? It's not bad, but it's not great. Uh, I wrote a, a research report in the Journal of Fixed Income about two or three years ago about the efficacy of the yield curve. It doesn't really work, uh, as I say, that successfully, except when you combine it with convexity. If you look at this is maybe a wonkish concept for equity investors, but convexity is the bulge in the curve. If you look at a flattening and bulging curve, that is a fantastic guide to future recession. And that's exactly what we're getting right now. We're getting a bulging curve and we're getting a flattening at the long end. And that is telling you that recession is almost certainly coming. Now, that's what the fixed income markets are discounting. And the implications of that particular pattern are that credit is going to worsen. And I think that, you know, if you look at high yield credits, I still think you've got probably another 300 basis points that go on spreads uh, in terms of credit markets, and there will be discomfort there. So I'm not optimistic about that particular area of the market. And as I said a moment ago, how many people do you know, how many institutions are overweight fixed income at the moment? I don't think many, because everyone's buying into this tightening uh, inflation narrative, and it's different from that. Uh, people want safe assets. Uh, there's a lot of pension money out there that needs 
uh, the safety of, uh, of US treasuries. That, uh, with the freezing of Russia's central bank reserves, would this represent a change to a more multi-currency reserve world? And uh, following up, will gold play a more substantial role to balance this multipolarity? I think it's a very good question. I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think logically that that would be correct. But then, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, if you look at um, uh, if you look at the dollar or you look at the euro, or you look at sterling or the yen. I mean, they're, they're much of a muchness. I mean, uh, it would have actually helped to diversify your your currency assets across uh, some of the major currency units. No, they're exactly there in the same orbit. Uh, can you get outside of that? Well, you can get into gold, but then in reality. You know, how is Russia going to sell its gold? Uh, you know, the, all the big bullion banks are, are, are basically US entities anyway. Uh, no one's going to take on that Russian risk. And so, you know, gold is almost frozen. I mean, you can try swapping it with uh, China, but good luck there because the Chinese are going to demand a, a, you know, a, a price very much in their favor. So I think that there, there are a lot of questions. I think that, however, inevitably, uh, the reaction of a lot of FX managers who you know are sort of very conservative thinking people anyway, will try to diversify more. They'll try and diversify into gold, I'm sure that's true. And I think cryptocurrencies, I think that there has to be a role now for cryptocurrencies, because I think that, you know, we've learned that even through this sort of turmoil, cryptocurrency exchanges in some form remain open, and they seem to be liquid. So I would say that would be the third asset to look at. Um, that's very relevant to um, this uh, last question from an attendee, which uh, uh, the attendee would be keen to hear your views on crypto effects. Okay, well, look, look crypto it moves exactly with the liquidity cycle, okay? In actual fact, if you, uh, if you plot um, a basket of crypto and gold, uh, uh, it market cap weighted, uh, against global liquidity, you'll find there's almost a one-for-one -one correspondence. Uh, and the reason for that is that basically crypto and gold are monetary hedges and liquidity expansion is a monetary inflation. Liquidity contraction is a monetary deflation. So they move exactly one-for-one. -one. Now, that tells you that if you want to hedge monetary inflation, uh, a basket of those assets would be an ideal one to, to use. And what we've seen in the last... Uh, three, four years, is that at the margin, people have focused more on the crypto element than the gold. Uh, that's higher beta. Uh, so it's gone up with liquidity rising, and it's coming down with liquidity falling. In the long term, my view is very optimistic about crypto, because I think it has a place. I think it's been established. I think the infrastructure that's been put in in many, many economies to actually deal with crypto uh, is, means it's permanent. Uh, even in the US, whatever the regulators may think or wish for now, uh, you know, the, 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 the stable door has been bust open uh, and, you know, the uh, uh, crypto is now a, a viable asset in the world economy. So I think it's, it's only going to go up uh, or use is going to go up and I think the price is going to go up in the medium term. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. I don't know about all the sort of the, the array or the periphery of different cryptocurrencies or NFTs or whatever it may be. But I'm saying the broad concept of crypto and cryptocurrencies is here to stay. And I think the Russian invasion, uh, as disastrous as it was, uh, is actually a great flip, a great boost uh, to the crypto industry. Thank you very much for that. Um, and finally, uh, what does QT look like to the cross-border capital? Well, we are, we're in a QT phase. I mean, QT, by definition, uh, is declining liquidity. Um, and I defined liquidity earlier on as a measure of sort of gross balance sheet capacity uh, in the financial sector. So it basically is a measure of how easy it is to refinance debt. And we've got an awful lot of debt to, to refinance. The great problem that central banks have, uh, have, uh, have basically raised is that what they're doing is they're focusing on a policy of, uh, of basically uh, oh, sorry, looking at liquidity uh, and very low interest rates. The problem with that particular mix is that very low interest rates are an incentive to take out debt. What the central banks should be doing is essentially keeping liquidity levels higher and raising interest rates. 
Now, the reason for doing that is that if you keep liquidity higher, you can refinance your debt rolls more easily. There are not dislocations in markets. And with higher interest rates, you disincentivize people to take on more debt. And if you go back to the 19th century, there was a very famous uh, British economist called Walter Badgett, who was the doyen, if you like, of central banking. And he wrote the very first textbook called Lombard Street about how you control uh, the money markets. And what he said was, uh, lend freely against good collateral, but at a high rate of interest. And that's the lesson that the Bank of England then took away. Why do I use the comparison of the 19th century? Is that the financial system in the 19th century in Britain, ironically or paradoxically, is almost the same as the world economy now. Now, okay, it's, it's much smaller, but the idea of shadow banks, big shadow banks, uh, repo markets, uh, volatile finance was all of the story of the 19th century. And uh, money markets then dominated, they're dominating again now, but the lesson that was learned at the time was lend freely at a high rate of interest. And that's what central banks have got to do. What we're doing at the moment is cutting uh, our lending by central banks, but keeping interest rates low. That is a disaster situation. Well, thank you very much for, for this, Michael. Uh, Great pleasure. Thank you for thank being you. so generous with your time and uh, answering all the audience's question. Uh, and thank you to all the attendees for being with us and for uh, sharing all those great questions with Michael. Um, if uh, you would like to engage Michael uh, directly, you can uh, contact your Smart Karma account manager. Uh, they will be happy to assist you uh, with that. Uh, and if there are any other questions that you have, you can email us at research at smartkarma.com. Uh, as I said, uh, we will be sharing uh, a recording of this session uh, after uh, afterwards. So uh, look out for that. And uh, um, thank you very much, Michael, once again. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.